Good evening and welcome to this special mental health edition of Doctors on Call. I'm Mary Morehouse, a psychotherapist with Insight Counseling of Duluth, and I will be your host for our program tonight on stress and anxiety. This special program is here to answer your questions about mental health issues that may affect you, your family, or friends. Please call or email your questions to, and we will do our best to address them. The telephone numbers and email address can be found at the bottom of your screen. Our expert guests this evening include Paige Benson, a licensed professional clinical counselor with MAP Behavior Health in Duluth. And Teresa Guerrero is the Director of Student Health and Wellness at the College of St. Scholastica. It is membership drive here at PBS North, so we have a bank of phone volunteers in the studio to take your questions and calls of support. Now let's begin our discussion of stress and anxiety. So great to have you both here tonight. I'm excited about talking about this concept or this, this topic. It's something very near and dear to my heart. So let's just start off um, right away. Paige, tell me a little bit about what kind of anxiety do you see in your practice? Well, thank you for having me here tonight. And uh, I see young adults okay. and adults, and I see a lot of different kinds of anxiety. Uh, I think that some people might not know if there's so many different types of anxiety. Um, I see a lot of just generalized anxiety. I uh, see a panic disorder, okay. uh, just situational anxiety from maybe transitions or change. Um, also see a lot of um, anxiety that comes from like post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, phobias, panic disorder. So all different kinds of, of anxiety um, people come in with, with concerns. Okay, so anxiety sounds like a, it's a big umbrella over a lot of what you see and there are a lot of things that come, OCD, that type yes. of thing also. Yes, yeah. social anxiety, mm -hmm. yeah. So all that under the um, um, umbrella. Okay, Teresa, tell me a little bit about what sort of anxiety you see in your practice. Sure. And again, I work in college mental health, mm -hmm. so working with college students. And one of the things we know about um, mental health disorders and difficulties is as stressors go up, vulnerability to mental health difficulties um, increases. Mm -hmm. And of course, college is a really st can be a potentially stressful time. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful opportunity for um, individuals to improve their life by their education, but it has comes with a lot of stressors. So I was really um, happy to be t talking about this topic because it's really timely for our college students and their mental health right now. We, um, one of the things that happens um, that's informative in college mental health is something called the Healthy Minds Survey. And so colleges all over the country participate in that. And one of um, the interesting pieces of information that came from the Healthy Minds study in 2021 was that uh, anxiety had surpassed mood disorders and depression as the most presenting concern. And in particular, Paige was speaking about different types of anxiety mm -hmm. disorders. Social anxiety topped the list, which I've been in college mental health for 25 years. That was really, I'd never seen in particular social anxiety social. top the list. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you for that. And that actually um, leads me to, so about three years ago, mm -hmm. this month, we all know what happened, right? Everything mm -hmm. kind of shut down. Um, I had a class of 2020 grad from high school, mm -hmm. and it's, she's a junior in, in college, and I personally feel like it still it has an impact on her. So kind of under the, through the lens, if you will, of, of the pandemic and things like that, what sorts of things do you feel like, you know, <coughs> has caused the stress and anxiety? I know in, in my practice personally, so when the pandemic shut down everything, the, um, my socially anxious kids were so happy because they got to be home. Mm -hmm. And then, and the, the other kids who fed on kind of getting that group dynamic, like they got their energy from people, were, had the anxiety. And then mm -hmm. when everyone went back to school, it flipped. So that was something I saw in my practice. Paige, tell me a little bit about kind of through the lens of, of, of this pandemic that we're kind of moving out of now um, or through. Um, how has that impacted? What have you seen through your practice before, during, and now after? Well, I can definitely agree that I, the clients that had more anxiety, you know, before the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, really liking to be a little bit more alone and isolated, mm -hmm. it really built their walls up even more, you know, be getting really comfortable at being home. And so then now, it's even harder to break down those walls of feeling comfortable, you know, of going out because they were so, felt so safe in that environment. 
Um, so definitely notice that the anxiety symptoms have gone up for that, for those kind of people. Mm -hmm. You know, for the other like kids and adults, I feel like that I see that experienced um, just like that socialized isolation that weren't really used to it. I think they got a lot more depressive symptoms and that was just really hard to see. You know, just really low motivation, um, just depressed mood, hopelessness, not knowing how to get out of it and then not having all the resources that we normally have. Um, and with students, I've noticed just it's almost harder, I, I see, for them to get like the motivation uh, to do it. And then also I think that the pandemic fed to a lot of things online, mm -hmm. which um, is kind of confusing for kids sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so just a little bit of like confusion and, and lack of motivation. Great. Yeah. Great. Can you tell me a little bit about what you saw, again, through the, through the lens, if you will, of, of the pandemic, what you what you've seen the change in your in your years of practice. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think we're still figuring out the impacts. Mm -hmm. um, there's an, another uh, piece of data that I think is really helpful. The Kaiser Foundation, in collaboration with the U.S. Census Bureau, looked at um, their, their census data, and in comparing 2019 to 2021, adults reporting anxiety disorders in 2019 was 11%. And in 2021, adults reporting anxiety disorders was 41%. When you see that represented on a graph, it's really, really significant. So in particular to college students, traditional age college students, because of course I see students of all ages, and it's important to note that all demographics were impacted by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, so every age group was impacted, but in particular, young adults, so those age 18 to 24, were most impacted in terms of reporting anxiety disorders. So yeah, we're seeing a lot of students come into our counseling centers with um, experiences of stress and anxiety. Okay, thank you so much. The questions are, are coming in fast and furious, so let's start getting to them. So I think this is, I love this question. If you're in the middle of a panic situation, panic attack or just a situation where you feel high stress in your body, what are some quick ways to interrupt that mm. and um, rebalance? Paige, yeah. you give us your, your quick, quick yeah. trips or tips quick, to, <laughs> yeah. to rebalance ourselves. Yeah, one that I learned from my supervisor that was something I hadn't heard before mm. was to eat a Sour Patch Kid. <laughs> eat a Sour Patch Kid. <laughs> because there's something with the sympathetic nervous system that kicks in when we're having a panic attack and the digestive system, mm -hmm. they don't really work very well together, mm -hmm. so it can kind of slow the panic down. Mm -hmm. um, if you can get into some type of like cold water or drink cold water, mm -hmm. uh, the temperature, it really changes the way that the brain thinks. Mm -hmm. um, staggered breathing really helps lower the heart rate. So okay. breathing in for like um, seven and exhaling for eight. Uh, there's a lot of different breathing exercises, but doing that will actually calm the heart, the heart down. Mm -hmm the heart rate down. And if you're in a panic, you really want to work on getting the physical bodily symptoms calmed down because you're you're not in your prefrontal cortex, so you're, you can't really think your way out of it. You really need to calm the body down. Calm the body down. Yeah. So those are some real, I always say your brain is offline. Yeah. So you need to work on getting it back online. Yeah. I like that. I hadn't heard the Sour Patch Kids. Yeah, it works. I've had clients that yeah. they carry them now. Yeah. And what's good <laughs> about everything that you just mentioned, uh, what I really like about that is you can do that almost anywhere. Yeah. You mm -hmm. don't just have to be in the perfect situation. You could do that in a classroom setting. Mm -hmm. You could do that while driving. You can do that in a lot of different scenarios. Um, and that's one of the things I love about the breathing exercises. But again, mm -hmm. everyone keeps some Sour Patch or other sort of like intense kind of yeah. flavor. What, what, what are your some, some of your go-tos for like a quick, quick in the moment uh -huh. uh, of stress relievers? I, I, th this is always a, a favorite of mine. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And I really appreciate everything that Paige just mentioned because mm -hmm. so much of it is stress lives in the body. Mm -hmm. And so we need to speak body language to mm -hmm. be able to calm that nervous system response down. There is um, a book that I think really informs this that I would recommend. It's called Burnout by Emily and Amelia Nagoski. Okay. And it's a New York Times bestseller. It came out in 2021 and it talks about completing the stress cycle. 
So if there's a panic response or an acute stress response, doing some of those things for the body to let the body know that you can calm down. So any kind of physical activity. And of course that could be running or working out, but it could also just be dancing or moving in any way, a walk. Mm -hmm. they, they recommend other things too, like a hug. Getting a 20 second hug can let the body know it's okay. Um, another one of my favorites is breathing as well. And I think experimenting with different types of breathing techniques. For me, one that I really like is called four, or four eight breathing. Mm -hmm. So just breathing in for four seconds, a nice deep, slow breath in for four seconds, and then breathing out slowly for eight seconds. Mm -hmm. um, so those are, I think also there can be, really speaking that body language, sometimes being able to have a good cry mm -hmm. or um, engaging in something creative. If you can just really quick be able to um, do some kind of activity, music, those kinds mm -hmm. of things can help calm that autonomic nervous system down. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Paige, we'll go back to you. What role does healthy eating and exercise play in mental health? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it's one of the first things that I usually talk to my clients about um, mm -hmm. because I pull it from DBT, which is Dialectical um, Behavioral Therapy, and it's one of the emotion regulation skills, and the acronym is PLEASE. And you check in on all of these to make sure uh, that your emotions are regulated, and it's your physical health, um, your eating, your alcohol or uh, caffeine consumption, sleep and exercise. And if you do these, if you make sure these five are okay, it's your foundation of yourself is a little bit more balanced and your emotional distress is gonna be more balanced. Um, the eating, like our, our, it's like our new brain in our gut, right? Like the food has uh, so much impact on us. It affects our mood. Um, it affects like the anxiety and the depression. So really eating healthy and it's different for everybody. So um, I think consulting with somebody on it is, is a good idea. And exercise is just awesome. I mean, you get tired so you sleep, you sleep better, you get endorphins so you feel happier and then you move your body so it's better you know, for your physical body, so. Great, yeah, mm -hmm. great, thank you. Um, next question. Um, I feel like my partner, so but this could be a partner, child, um, um, uh, has a problem with anxiety, but re but doesn't want to get help. Mm. What can I do to help them? And so like, and and also kind of going uh, to kind of shoulder to to jump on that more is what what sorts of things do you look for in your loved ones? Mm -hmm. Again, whether either it's a partner or a child or a parent mm -hmm. that has stress and anxiety that is. Um, it, it goes more towards that disorder than just normal everyday stress. Because stress is, is part of life. But you know, at what point do you feel like it's kind of that signal that this person needs help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. And while I think the stigma about mm -hmm. mental health and accessing services is going down, it still exists, or just for a variety of reasons. Um, an individual might not be ready to take that step but that loved ones and friends and natural supports can do a lot just by being present and listening. And a part of stress and anxiety is, is that emotions get stuck. And we have to be able to um, move through that stress cycle and move through those emotions. So just that experience of belonging and listening and showing empathy and support can go a long way. And then it's just planting seeds of encouragement about um, how there's also other kinds of support out there too. Yeah, great, thank you. And Paige, to kind of, yeah, to keep going along with that, wh at what point does this mm, everyday stress, anxiety, mm -hmm. worries, however we wanna uh, um, talk about it, when does it start to kind of become into that disorder? When does it, when do you feel like is kind of that, um, that time that you feel like people should, should reach out and, and, and it's starting to affect them, mm -hmm. you know? So w what are the things that you look for that you see? Yeah, usually I, you look at to see like what areas of their life they're starting to um, not function very well in. 
And so the different areas of that we look at are like social, like are they engaging in their you know normal social activities? Mm -hmm. um, they're educational or academic, like are they um, able to succeed in school and understand and process it? Occupational, like are they able to go to work every day, understand and concentrate? Um, their relationships, like how are they functioning in relationships, and then also just like self-care, are they taking care of themselves, are they taking care of their home, and I think when some or one of those areas become really impaired and make life somewhat difficult or difficult, mm -hmm. then people, I would urge people to go in if they're not already going in, okay. but definitely when life starts to get difficult in those in those different areas. Gotcha, okay, okay. Um, Great, thank you. Because I think that that's kind of a big thing. What, at what point is this kind of you know getting to to that to that um, to that next level? So, um, students that are returning to in-person learning, mm. they're kind of anxious about this kind of back, which kind of we, we talked about a little bit at the beginning. But what can what can people do? You know, online learning for a lot of unless we have snow days like. I believe today was a snow day, yeah. <laughs> but, but you know, a lot of different, you know, educational, higher education, elementary, middle school, high school, are there starting to be like, you don't really have a choice, you kind of have to come in, and that the kids who are really having a hard time with that. What are some things that, you know, you, that you would recommend to kind of get back into that, into that school setting? Mm -hmm. And in higher education, th we are having those conversations every day. In many ways, I think that the experience of the pandemic, along with many of um, issues of social injustice and all of the stressors that have impacted our young people, um, our young adults, we are having to approach education differently. And so, um, uh, we're, we're having a lot of conversations about that, that some, in some ways we have had to get creative in educational environments to adjust and to support students. Um, and just giving them the opportunity to slowly create new habits. Mm -hmm. And of course, academic stressors are something that impact a lot of college students. And their, the way that they were studying and learning during the time of pandemic was very different. So I think we yeah. all, just as communities of learning need to be patient with our young people as they make those adjustments and learn those new habits. Yeah, yeah, very important. Mm -hmm. um, Paige, back to you. Um, I, um, meditation and anxiety, what, what do you see with, with the benefits of meditation and anxiety? Well, I love meditation and I could talk a really, <laughs> really long time on it. Um, but for anxiety, I mean, when you, when you meditate, the purpose of the meditation is to, you know, focus on one thing um, and then when you start to drift off is to pull your attention back. Mm -hmm. And every day when we're worrying and thinking and going along with our everyday routines, our brains are in these circuits of thinking that um, probably have been going for years and years and years. And when we meditate, we, we try to get our brain to stop that circuit. And when we do that over and over again, we're able to like catch attention of like what our thoughts are a little bit more often. Um, and then when we're able to catch our thoughts, then we're able to ask ourselves, are those thoughts you know, helpful for us or not? And if not, then we can try to reframe them, uh, which obviously helps some of the anxiety because a lot of anxiety is the worry about too many things and excessive. So a meditation practice can be one to three minutes in the morning and you can use apps and whatever um, and it's all out there and it is a practice. Some days you're really good and you might only drift off a few times and the next you might have like complete monkey mind <laughs> and not be able to do it. But I, I definitely recommend meditation for everybody okay. and it helps so many things more more than just anxiety and it, it helps with the, um, the, the 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 muscle like like yes. anything else in life the more you yeah. do it, the, the easier it gets as we mentioned at the beginning of our program it is membership week here at PBS North doctors on call is a special and unique local show that requires your support to make it happen each week we'll be back after learning about why your donations to PBS North are so important Thank you, Mary. Hi, I'm Tom Jamar, 
Director of Marketing, Communications, and Membership Services here at PBS North. And I'm here with Ashley Smith, our Director of Content. And we're so happy you joined us tonight. Absolutely. Our phone volunteers are also with us tonight and have not only been taking your questions, but also your contributions. Doctors on Call is an iconic local show from PBS North that seems like it's always been here, and thanks to your donations. It's been a part of our community for 41 years, and contributions to PBS North will allow it to continue for decades more. And we're going right back to the show, so stay with us. But we first want to tell you a bit more why this show and everything you see here on PBS North is so unique and important. At PBS North, we strive to bring you content that informs, entertains, and educates viewers of all ages. We make it our mission to connect with you and provide content that's essential, engaging, entertaining, and informing, like this one. The funding that makes this possible comes from viewers like you. As an added bonus, the PBS North Board of Directors will match any donations made during this program up to $2,000. That means if you donate $50, it will actually count as $100 towards our fundraising goal. So if you've been thinking about donating, now is the perfect time to do it. Your donations will help us continue to bring you informative and engaging programming like Doctors on Call that address important health topics and connect you with leading medical experts in our community. So whether you can give $5, $50, or $500, your donation will go twice as far thanks to this matching challenge. Simply call us at 218-788-2844, go online to pbsnorth.org, or use your mobile device to scan the code on your screen. And take pride in knowing that when you make a contribution right now, you'll be joining thousands of your friends and neighbors in providing some of our most reliable funding. Your contribution fuels our mission and investment in the programs and shows that you count on every day. Now we're hoping we can count on you. So please make your gift right now by calling 218-788-2844, go online to pbsnorth.org, or use your mobile device to scan the code on your screen. When you do, we have some great ways to say thanks. When you become a supporting member of PBS North right now, we have some wonderful ways to thank you for your support. Make a sustaining contribution of $10 per month or $120 at one time, and we'll thank you with the Light Therapy Lamp. This therapy lamp mimics sunlight. Regular light therapy has been linked to alleviating symptoms of depression and other mood disorders, as the bright light exposure may boost serotonin and help reset sleep cycles. When you make a sustaining contribution of $15 per month or a single gift of $180, We'll thank you with a three-book set of happiness and well-being, including 10% Happier by author Dan Harris, The Art of Happiness, written by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Howard C. Cutter, M.D., and Mindfulness and Meditation by Andy Pudicombe. And when you support PBS North with a sustaining gift of $25 per month or $300, we'll thank you with a light therapy lamp, the three book set of happiness and well being, and a one month unlimited membership to the Savalia Yoga Studio in downtown Duluth, sharing the wisdom and practice of yoga in a way that is accessible, inclusive, and honors choice. Whichever amount you choose and whichever thank you gift you select, the most important part is that you make your donation to ensure that PBS North remains strong in the days and months ahead. Do your part by calling 218-788-2844 by scanning the QR code on your screen or by giving online at pbsnorth.org. Those are some really great and useful thank you gifts. And Svelia Yoga is a trauma-conscious, healing-centered, and growth-oriented studio, sharing wisdom and practice in a way that's accessible and inclusive. So a month of unlimited yoga at yeah. Svelia Yoga can really make a difference in your life or in the life of someone that you care about. In addition to any one of these incredible thank you gifts, you'll also get access to PBS Passport, which lets you watch your favorite shows on demand on your schedule. Please visit us online at pbsnorth.org or call 218-788-2844 to become a member today. Is there a program you'd like to watch again? Maybe a performance you didn't get a chance to see? Well, now you can with PBS Passport. A terrific member benefit that lets you stream more than a thousand hours of PBS and local programming on your computer or through the PBS app on your phone, tablet, smart TV, or streaming device. All your favorites wherever, whenever you want. And with your qualifying contribution, you'll help make the great programs on this station possible. So reach out to the number on your screen or go online and get your PBS Passport today. The shows at PBS North provide hours of entertainment and education, but they also come at a cost. 
That's why it's so important that you support this vital community service today. Our volunteers here are ready to take your calls. So put them to work by calling 218-788-2844. It really does take financial support from viewers like you to make shows like these possible, especially a weekly live show where we take your questions and provide informed answers to help you and others in your community. You can give at any level that works for you. And when you do, we have some excellent ways to say thanks. When you become a supporting member of PBS North right now, we have some wonderful ways to thank you for your support. Make a sustaining contribution of $10 per month or $120 at one time, and we'll thank you with the light therapy lamp. This therapy lamp mimics sunlight. Regular light therapy has been linked to alleviating symptoms of depression and other mood disorders, as the bright light exposure may boost serotonin and help reset sleep cycles. When you make a sustaining contribution of $15 per month or a single gift of $180, We'll thank you with a three-book set of happiness and well-being, including 10% Happier by author Dan Harris, The Art of Happiness, written by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Howard C. Cutter, M.D., and Mindfulness and Meditation by Andy Pudicombe. And when you support PBS North with a sustaining gift of $25 per month or $300, we'll thank you with the Light Therapy Lamp, the three-book set of happiness and well-being, and a one-month unlimited membership to the Savalia Yoga Studio in downtown Duluth, sharing the wisdom and practice of yoga in a way that is accessible, inclusive, and honors choice. Whichever amount you choose and whichever thank you gift you select, the most important part is that you make your donation to ensure that PBS North remains strong in the days and months ahead. Do your part by calling 218-788-2844 by scanning the QR code on your screen or by giving online at pbsnorth.org. Supporting PBS North is easy to do. If you've never given before, just join us for the first time. If you usually renew, make it easy on yourself and switch to an ongoing monthly giving as a sustainer. Or if you've been giving at the same level for a while, make today the day that you bump that up a few dollars. It's always up to you. We're returning to the expert panel to answer more of your questions in just a moment. But before we do, you can take just two minutes to support this unique show. This programming is created just for our local audience, and you are not going to find it anywhere else. If you are already a member, thank you. And if you wanted to become a member but haven't done so yet, right now, during Doctors on Call, is the perfect time. Uh, to do so. So every dollar will go twice as far with our match. Thanks to the match by PBS North Board of Directors. And please call us at 218-788-2844, go online to pbsnorth.org, or scan the code on your screen and make your investment in PBS North. Now, let's get back to the show. Thank you. Welcome back to Doctors on Call. Let's get back to questions on our topic, stress and anxiety. Um, Paige, we'll start with you. Um, what are some tools, methods to help if we find ourselves flopping around in the middle, <laughs> awake in the middle of the night at 11 p.m., 1 a.m., 3 a.m.? I mean, I think we've all done that. We wake up in the middle of the night either, and we just have these ruminating, anxious thoughts. So what are some ways to help get those thoughts at bay and get back to sleep? Well, uh, there's a lot of different things we can try. Uh, for people who haven't heard of like sleep hygiene, uh, if you look it up online, sleep hygiene also has just Googling it and looking at it has a lot of different ideas on how we can try to sleep better. Um, but quick tips on like what I usually would tell clients is that, you know, not watching the clock, um, not going on your phone because that's just gonna like activate more thinking. Reading but not reading anything um, that you're really interested in. They <laughs> say to read something kind of boring so that you kind of fall asleep from it. Um, and if you are laying there for about 20 minutes or so to get up and to maybe like go um, take a drink of water and try not to turn too many lights on when you do it but like to get up and then go lay back down. Um, you know, another thing too is, because I like meditation so well, they do have uh, sleep meditations that you can um, maybe pop your earbuds in and listen to like a sleep meditation or a sleep story, um, something like that. Essential oils, lavender is great for sleep. Uh, and so much too depends upon what you do during the day. 
Mm -hmm. um, so again, I would look into what are you eating, what are you drinking, um, getting a really good bedtime routine, um, taking a warm shower before you go to bed can be helpful because the decrease in your temperature kind of calms you down a little bit, drinking some chamomile tea, shutting your phone off, you know, going through all those different kind of uh, nighttime rituals can really start to cue the body, kind of like when we give our babies a bath <laughs> before they go to bed and then they're all sleepy. It's yeah. kind of the same for us. Yeah, and I mean, we're, our bodies want to sleep. Sometimes we need to get that mind out of the way. Yes. Yeah. Can, can I add just a little yes, bit to yes, that? Those are please, great please, strategies. Please, yes. And yeah. I think about this a lot with <laughs> college students yes. Yes. because sleep can be a real challenge for many college students. And a part of that is just developmental. For traditional age college students, their, their biorhythms are changing and they tend to stay up later and that's actually pretty normal developmentally. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I work on with my college students is to try to regulate their timing with sleep and at the very least try to get up at the, about the same time every day can start to regulate those biorhythms. Yeah. I'm not very popular when I tell them that I want them to get up at the same time, but um, I remember <laughs> hearing that that message in yeah. college, and it's it's a hard it's a hard one because we fight against what we really want sure. to do. It's a hard it's hard for to. yeah. If you sometimes you just want to sleep in on a yeah. you know, but it, it does help with regulating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and so we're get, we're gonna just, just stick with you for a second. Sure. Chronic stress and illness, and those are kind of two different things. So a chronic stress impact mental health and then can a chronic illness impact and how are those two chronic conditions I guess mm -hmm. um, impact a mental health and anxiety yeah um, certainly both of them definitely increase vulnerability for mental health difficulty and with chronic stress until you complete that stress cycle until you find ways of moving through that stress it just accumulates mm -hmm. so we do see for individuals who've had a lot of chronic stress that um, it, stress lives in the body and every system of the body is impacted. So our digestive system, our endocrine system, everything is impacted. So diseases um, can manifest in all sorts of ways from mm -hmm. stress. One of the things I notice with college students is that if they have a lot of stressors throughout the semester, they're studying, maybe they're needing to work. Many students now in order to afford college need to carry a job. Um, maybe they've had family stressors or stressors in their communities. Um, that there's often, it's not at all uncommon, I'll say to my students, don't be surprised if after finals, the stressors are gone, the finals are over, and then they get sick right when the semester ends. And it's because their body has been accumulating that stress. So some mindfulness about just taking extra good care of themselves when the stressor goes away. And the same with chronic illness, just um, the, the coping that you have to do when there's chronic pain mm -hmm. and managing that can leave you vulnerable as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, all right, Paige, what's your favorite way to cope with stress? What, what are your go-to <laughs> things? Well, I think it's really important uh, when you have a lot of stress and anxiety to really try to, again, I've said this, but calm the, calm the body and calm the mind. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, if my body is kind of stressed and I feel like a little bit uh, tense and stuff, I really like to like take a warm shower, take a warm bath, um, a sauna or a hot tub if you have it is really good. Um, yoga is really good to like calm the body. Um, you know, doing uh, body scan meditation if you want to do that or progressive muscle relaxation. Um, those kind of things I think really can help the body relax. Um, and then it, for like relaxing the mind a little bit more. Like when we're really worrying and we're thinking, it's like we're in this emotion side of our brain. Mm -hmm. And to kind of pull it over to the left side to kind of quiet that a little bit. Um, I personally like to do puzzles. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but you can do puzzles or reading or art. Um, you can do just like a, you know, any kind of like exercise. Um, but anything that's gonna really listen to music that's going to pull your brain away from the worry um, is really helpful for a little while um, to just kind of calm calm the brain down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? What are your go-tos, Teresa? Yeah, I love this question. I know <laughs> it's a great one. Um, I probably my favorite thing is being in nature, going for walks 
in the Northland, we have so many beautiful natural resources, mm -hmm. so I definitely, that's my favorite way. But some other ways that I've been thinking about recently, one thing that decreases stress is I think just social interaction and belonging, mm -hmm. so getting together with friends always mm -hmm. helps me, and I think was one of the things impacted that increased our stress vulnerability during the time of um, the pandemic. And then I would also add humor, I think, is a really mm -hmm. good stress reliever. So sometimes my husband and I will watch goofy TikToks about pets that seem <laughs> ridiculous. And there's a, a good belly laugh, a, a really good laugh, is that releasing that stress that's in the body. So those are a few. I mm -hmm. liked a lot of yours too, but yeah. those are a few other ones I'd add. That yeah, are my favorites. And, yeah, and that reminds of pets. If you happen, if you're so lucky as to have a pet, yes, um, a, you know, a cat or a, or yes. a dog or uh -huh. a bunny or whatever pet you have, a goat, a goat, yeah. whatever, whatever, <laughs> three, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> three, three that's amazing. Um, so things like that that are kind of your go-tos. But I right. think what what this shows you is, you know, you two are professionals, and we are, and they're different. We all have, mm -hmm. we all need to find what that is in our own lives and the reality of our own, you know, practice um, to, to figure out what works for us. Right. You mm -hmm. know, and I think that that's just, so find your space and find your place that, that works for works for you in lots of different environments mm -hmm. because we can't always have, to, I love to walk in nature, we can't always, yeah. we can't, right. it, you know, the things that are kind of so a multi-level mm -hmm. um, kind of oh, uh, different ways mm -hmm. to kind so of do that. Mm -hmm. Lots of options. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, give yourself a big suitcase of this. So, um, see, I think I just, okay, well, back to you. Um, how can I, so as a parent, and you notice that your kids are starting to become a little stressed and anxious, that you're feeling a little concerned, what are some good tips for parents mm. when we're seeing our children, and children can be any age, mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what are some things that you can kind of, helpful for parents to help their kid, their child, young adult to help get through stressful situations? Paige. Well, I would say one, it really depends upon the kid. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have some children who really are an open book and then other kids who kind of, you know, keep keep everything pretty close. So depending upon like how open they are with it really is going to determine what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. I always really encourage parents to read books about like if just to, because a, a, chi a child's book on anxiety is going to be in their language and um, you really use, you know, analogies and metaphors and stuff that kids can understand. Um, and I just really getting them to understand that that anxiety um, is normal mm -hmm. and that even if their anxiety is a little bit too big for them, that you can manage it and it's not always going to be a part of them. We don't want them to identify as like always being an anxious person. That we there are tools that you can learn to try to calm it down. Mm -hmm. um, I think for kids teaching them the emotional intelligence, especially just about the body, mm -hmm. like what it feels like, where does it live, you know, where are you noticing it. Um, so really just getting down on their level and you know asking them where it's at, what does it feel like, mm -hmm. um, and yeah just kind of talk, talking through them with yeah. it. Yeah, that's great because, you know, those younger kids, that's the that stereotypical kindergarten, first grade, second grade, tummy ache. I have a tummy ache, I don't yeah. want to go to school. That's kind of how it manifests. And then older kids, it can come out as no, anger, you know, that, that mm -hmm. type of thing. So kind of being in touch. And then another thing is maybe change. If there's a change, if some of that developmentally, and maybe you could speak to that, Teresa, a little bit, uh, you know, developmentally we kids change we all change but you know at what point I, and again I think because you work with college students parents a lot of times are away um, or you know kind of that older child um, which is where my kids are all in that kind of that older um, so at, at, at what point you know do you does that become worrisome as a parent mm -hmm. for, and and for that that change piece yes and you know I think um, just paying attention and being in tune with that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the biggest, most important things we can do is just be present mm -hmm. for our kids, listen and believe our kids and our young people. And um, really, I think validating, it, 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 growing up is tough and validating what they're experiencing and just being present. It's, it can be um, difficult, I think, as parents to know if our children are struggling and suffering. 
and yet just being there, being a sounding board to help them think through what they can do. Uh, I, um, when I talk with parents who are having their young adults come to college, I talk about how really a part of the goal of parenting is from the time that our, our children come into our life, we're always letting go a little bit the first time they take a step, the first time they have a sleepover, the first time they drive a car with their license, uh, <laughs> speaking of anxiety. Um, and that is the goal, that we're empowering them with some skills, helping them to listen to their body and validating their experience as they continue to, we let go uh, um, more and more as they, they, they age. Yes. Yeah, and I do think it's really mm -hmm. important too to tell your children that um, we're not always supposed to be happy. We're mm -hmm. not always gonna be just in this like happy, happy mood, um, and that it's okay to feel, you know, sad or whatever, whatever emotion we're feeling. They're telling us something about ourselves, and mm -hmm. um, and to learn how to ride through that, mm -hmm. and to teach your child <laughs> and to how to ride through it, and to not like helicopter or lawnmower it mm -hmm. out of their way, so mm -hmm. so that when they are on their own in college, I've seen that where kids just don't know what to do because it's kind of been taken care of for them. So as hard as it, hard it is, is for, for us to see our kids go through these hard times, um, we can, like you said, stand by them and, and, and guide them and, and hope that we're gonna mm -hmm. teach them to do this on their own someday. Teach them how to learn to tolerate that yes. uncomfortableness mm -hmm. that <laughs> is a part of this inevitable part of life. Yes. And to kind of, and I think, again, not to kind of go back to the pandemic piece, but again, developmentally, that was such a big three years that we, you know, depending on the situation, we saw more of our kids. Mm -hmm. I had two kids come home for spring break from college and they, in March, and they didn't leave until August. It's lovely. It was wonderful <laughs> to have them all home. Uh, not that I'm, I'm complaining, but it, you know, that it was, they were out of their element and then you were there to show them how to be, you could kind of comfort them and to kind of, to, to sit back and, and, and just have this be, this uncomfortable anxiety space is, yeah, that's kind of, that's part of it. It's, it and yeah. it's not fun. Mm -hmm. It's not fun. And so that kind of goes back. So, you know, this question of can a little stress and anxiety be good so can you speak can kind of expound on that a little bit more or expand on that a little bit more of how like when it's, I mean stress and anxiety is 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 good that's kind of the space where we um, have growth yeah you know and I know you see that a lot in college but it, can you speak a little bit about kind of how we can um, change the um, you know kind of change the the tone of it and when we can when the stress and anxiety is positive for us yeah or how we can tamp it back yeah. so it is pop positive yeah I know that there's a lot of studies and like um, you know theories and stuff on like different uh, like how the arousal or how anxiety can like be beneficial for us. Mm -hmm. And I do know that like if our arousal is at like a good point mm -hmm. and um, meaning our like anxiety about a situation, mm -hmm. um, our performance is a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, so like if we're gonna like do a race or if we're gonna like take a test or something like um, that arousal does do a, do uh, well for us. However, if it goes over, like in these bell curves or whatever they are, um, if it goes over it, then then it's not helpful for us mm -hmm. because it's just way too much stress and it's debilitating. Um, the same goes for like if you don't have any like anxiety or stress about mm -hmm. something that um, you might not perform as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so the anxiety sometimes can be really good for that anxiety performance. And I always tell people if you're a little anxious. Um, like I was today, <laughs> is that it means something to yeah. you. And so um, trying to feel comfortable in your body, in that stress and anxiety, and knowing that you can still perform it even though you're nervous mm -hmm. or anxious about it. Yeah. 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 And I, yeah, I, we were all stressed and a little anxious, and we all showed up on time, right? You know, yeah, so right. like it, it can be motivating. It, yes. it, too, like anything in life, too much of a good thing is a bad thing, but not enough is not good either. Right. Um, and so d tell me a little bit about how you see like kind of that, you know, and I know the, 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 the curve, I call it the gray zone, this kind of high performance, just the right amount of anxiety for the right amount of high performance. What do you see, again, kind of in, in the population that you see to kind of to talk to people about this? Um, 
this stress is, is, mm -hmm. is actually pretty motivating because you did get the A on the paper, you got the grade you wanted or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that Paige did a nice job of explaining mm -hmm. that normalizing and mm -hmm. um, letting students know that carrying a little bit of stress is your friend. You mm -hmm. want that because it will just increase that nervous system response to make you more alert, that your body will start to do the things that need to happen so that you are um, just cognitively more prepared to perform. So I think when you let students know that that can be, that's advantageous and educating that it can work to your benefit to be a little bit stressed. Um, you stress, not de-stress, that you want a little bit of that. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, what about, um, Paige, tell me a little bit about procrastination and anxiety. So people, you know, they procrastinate, they're, you know, and, and then they get really anxious and then kind of that anxiety, procrastination, mm -hmm. um, motivation, kind of all those, you know, they, they seem to be so kind of tied in together. Yeah. Well, I know that procrastination um, can cause a lot of anxiety. Yes. Uh, and some people are very motivated by it. Mm -hmm. And I know I work with some college students and work with uh, just like different skills to give them to try to get them to be motivated um, ahead of time to not procrastinate. And I know one thing I always tell my, my clients is like when they're procrastinating is make a list of one, two, three, and one are things you have to do right away to maybe the next day, three, whenever. And, um, you can only do things on list one. You can't do two or three until one is done. Because sometimes our minds want to do the easy things and the more fun things. And so I always say you have to do that before you can do this or that. And then you have to do two before you can do three. Um, so sometimes just really working with that procrastination um, can obviously help decrease the stress. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, procrastination makes in some ways, we are wired this way. Our brains are wired to resist or avoid pain. If you think about, if you put your hand on a hot stove, you pull it away, you, you, we avoid pain. So if there's an, some kind of assignment or um, obligation we have that causes some discomfort, we get avoidant. And yet it, become, it snowballs, the more avoidant the more anxiety. So some of it's just some psychoeducation around how that's working. And can you take one small step? Can we think about kind of what you were saying, different steps? Um, let's come up with the 10 steps that you might need. Could you do one of those that, today? And, get and I like normalizing just, just enough and we're kind of hardwired to do that. Thank you. I want to thank our panelists, Paige Benson and Teresa Guerrero, for their time and expertise tonight, and for those of you who called in or emailed questions. Please join Dr. Peter Nalen next week for a program on eye problems, when his guests will be Dr. Charlie Ahrens, Dr. Matthew Kosak, and Dr. Lisa Graham. Thank you for joining us tonight. This type of programming can only happen with viewer support. You can keep all the shows on PBS North healthy when you become a supporting member. Let's check in with Ashley and Tom one more time. Hi, I'm Tom Jamar, and I'm joined in the studio once again by Ashley Smith. And we are here tonight with our phone volunteers that have been taking your questions for Doctors on Call and your donations to the station. Tonight's volunteers are some board members and staff of PBS North and also community members. And we're all here at the end of the show to remind you that this live program has been a part of this community for 41 years. And that commitment requires resources. Resources that come from viewers like you. You won't find Doctors on Call anywhere else in this area but on PBS North. That's where public broadcasting excels, providing shows that inform, entertain, and educate. And we have some exciting news to share tonight. The PBS North Board of Directors has offered to match all donations made um, during our shows tonight, up to $2,000. This is an incredible opportunity for us to raise the funds we need to continue, continue bringing you the programming that you love. Your donation will help us to bring you important news and information, thought-provoking documentaries, and engaging entertainment. And the best part? Your donation will be matched dollar for dollar up to $2,000. So if you donate $50, that's actually $100 towards our fundraising goal. Join the PBS North family today and make your contribution right now by calling 218-788-2844 
go online to pbsnorth.org or use your mobile device to, to scan the code on your screen. There's no better time to give than right now. When you become a supporting member of PBS North right now, we have some wonderful ways to thank you for your support. Make a sustaining contribution of $10 per month or $120 at one time, and we'll thank you with the Light Therapy Lamp. This therapy lamp mimics sunlight. Regular light therapy has been linked to alleviating symptoms of depression and other mood disorders, as the bright light exposure may boost serotonin and help reset sleep cycles. When you make a sustaining contribution of $15 per month or a single gift of $180, We'll thank you with a three-book set of happiness and well-being, including 10% Happier by author Dan Harris, The Art of Happiness, written by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Howard C. Cutter, M.D., and Mindfulness and Meditation by Andy Pudicombe. And when you support PBS North with a sustaining gift of $25 per month or $300, we'll thank you with the Light Therapy Lamp, the three-book set of happiness and well-being, and a one-month unlimited membership to the Savalia Yoga Studio in downtown Duluth, sharing the wisdom and practice of yoga in a way that is accessible, inclusive, and honors choice. Whichever amount you choose and whichever thank you gift you select, the most important part is that you make your donation to ensure that PBS North remains strong in the days and months ahead. Do your part by calling 218-788-2844, by scanning the QR code on your screen, or by giving online at pbsnorth.org. In addition to these fantastic thank you gifts, when you become a member for $5 a month or more, you also get access to PBS Passport, which lets you watch your favorite shows on demand on your schedule. And your access continues for as long as you're a PBS North member. What's the best thing about a passport? Freedom. You know you can grab it and go someplace inspiring, someplace romantic, someplace unexpected. Oh. When you support your PBS station, you can enjoy PBS Passport, a member benefit that lets you stream great performances, How dare you? masterpiece, all your favorites when and where you want them. Oh my God. Reach out to the number on your screen or go online to make a qualifying contribution. And away you go. Passport is convenient and a little addictive. It's a free benefit of PBS North membership that allows you to binge watch series, learn something new, or revisit favorites from PBS and PBS North, including current and past seasons of Doctors on Call. Join us now as a sustainer at pbsnorth.org or call us right now at 218-788-2844. Your contribution, alongside those of your fellow community members, is what keeps PBS North available to everyone. Not everyone can make a contribution right now, so if you can, we're asking you to commit to the spirit of generosity and make your gift right now. And when you do, please consider becoming a sustaining member of PBS North. Sustainers give an ongoing monthly contribution that we know we can count on, and it helps us plan better for the future. A gift in any amount makes a profound difference in our ability to bring you the programming you value and create new content for tomorrow. Don't wait to do your part. Become a sustainer today. Sustaining membership is an easy and convenient way to support the programs you love. As a sustaining member, you make an ongoing monthly contribution from either your checking account or credit card. The amount you give is entirely up to you. Your donation will happen automatically each month, so you never have to worry about your membership expiring. If you do need to change the amount of your monthly contribution, just contact us. Best of all, when you make a qualifying donation, you can enjoy our most popular member benefit ever, PBS Passport. With Passport, you can watch an incredible collection of drama, science, art, and history programs whenever you want. You can stream them on your TV using the PBS app for your Roku, Apple TV, Fire TV, newer Samsung Smart TV, or Android TV or watch on your phone, tablet, or computer. So please, call or go online to start your sustaining membership now. We are already at $900 tonight, just in this show alone. And if we match that with our, our great PBS uh, board member match, that's $1,800, and we can't thank you enough. Now is the time to show your support. So please, pick up the phone and call us at 218-788-2844 and talk to one of these wonderful volunteers. You can also give online at pbsnorth.org or scan the code on your screen with your mobile device to quickly get to our donation page. And when you do, we have some terrific ways to say thanks. 
When you become a supporting member of PBS North right now, we have some wonderful ways to thank you for your support. Make a sustaining contribution of $10 per month or $120 at one time, and we'll thank you with the light therapy lamp. This therapy lamp mimics sunlight. Regular light therapy has been linked to alleviating symptoms of depression and other mood disorders, as the bright light exposure may boost serotonin and help reset sleep cycles. When you make a sustaining contribution of $15 per month or a single gift of $180, We'll thank you with a three-book set of happiness and well-being, including 10% Happier by author Dan Harris, The Art of Happiness, written by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Howard C. Cutter, M.D., and Mindfulness and Meditation by Andy Pudicombe. And when you support PBS North with a sustaining gift of $25 per month or $300, we'll thank you with the Light Therapy Lamp, the three-book set of happiness and well-being, and a one-month unlimited membership to the Savalia Yoga Studio in downtown Duluth, sharing the wisdom and practice of yoga in a way that is accessible, inclusive, and honors choice. Whichever amount you choose and whichever thank you gift you select, the most important part is that you make your donation to ensure that PBS North remains strong in the days and months ahead. Do your part by calling 218-788-2844 by scanning the QR code on your screen or by giving online at pbsnorth.org. Thank you for joining us as we listen to our medical experts answer many of your questions as they do here on a regular basis. Before we go, we want to thank the Boat Club Restaurant for providing food for our production and phone, phone volunteers. And speaking of those volunteers, they are some of our PBS North board members and community members, and they are still standing by to take your call. We have $1,100 left in this match, so get it in. Please keep them busy by donating at 218-788-2844 or make your donation online at pbsnorth.org. And remember, our board members will be matching, again, your donation dollar for dollar up to $2,000 tonight. So don't wait. This is your final chance in this show to make your contribution go further. Thank you.